Thanks, Phil. Afternoon, everybody. Um, great to be here. And as, as Phil says, recently appointed as GMCA lead for employment skills and digital, but in the case of digital, reappointed, having led on the portfolio in 2018-19. I'm really pleased to be back, actually, because in Greater Manchester, as I'm sure you all know, we're doing digital differently. We're committed to being a digital city region that puts our residents at the heart of our plans, and we're working towards our ambitions to be recognised as a world leading digital city region. As many of you will know, last year we launched the new Greater Manchester Digital Blueprint, which sets out a three year approach to meeting our collective ambitions for our city region. Obviously, it's been an incredibly difficult period over the last year, but today is an opportunity to reflect on that. And whilst it has been challenging for many, it's been a period when digital ways of working have really come to the fore. A recent iGov survey found that 87% of organisations have accelerated their digital strategies over the past 12 months, and that 75% of those organisations will be adopting some sort of blended home office working arrangements in the future. And so we are still going through an incredibly tough period for many people, but it's fantastic to see our creative, digital and tech sector shining so brightly, offering exciting career opportunities for people and strong economic potential alongside our social and public innovation. Figures out last week show that the Northwest has overtaken the Southeast in terms of foreign direct investment with Greater Manchester being the largest beneficiary in the region. These organisations are wanting to tap into the tech talent, cost effectiveness and entrepreneurial spirit behind homegrown successes like the Hutt Group, AO and Auto Trader, as well as our social enterprises and our willingness to collaborate to innovate. What underpins this are our universities and colleges, our infrastructure and the dedicated support available to tech companies with particular specialisms, including City Labs in Manchester, GCHQ's programmes, Host in Salford and Ashton Old Baths in Tameside, to name but a few. So thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to be sharing just some of the Greater Manchester story with you, and I know that colleagues will have attended some fantastic Digital Leaders events so far this week. Events of this kind really are invaluable to us as a community, and as I said at the start, it's great to be here. And so I'll finish by introducing a short video of what we're working towards here in GM. Greater Manchester is doing digital differently. We're putting people at the heart of our digital ambitions and joining the dots to make things happen. We have a digital ecosystem worth five billion pounds. We're the biggest tech cluster outside of London and we're growing fast. we always wanted to be uh, a digital leader. Uh, we want to put digital at the heart of everything we do. Uh, we have been working very closely with our partners in Greater Manchester Combined Authority and uh, Virgin Media Business. And I'm very confident that once this project is complete, uh, it will be a game changer for our businesses and our communities in Wigan. most deprived areas of Greater Manchester. 41% of our children are classified by the government as disadvantaged. Parents are having to make really difficult choices where there might only be one device in a household with two or three children. One may be at primary school, one may be at secondary. Who gets the device? How often do they get it? Not having a computer or knowing full well that their internet connectivity may be not as strong as they need it to be. It must be terribly isolating. You're not seeing that face of that member of staff who makes a difference in your life.
been a brilliant, amazing all-round experience. Uh, joining this course has been life-changing. Now I would say I feel a lot more confident. Focused. It's inspired and knowledgeable. The word should be optimistic. Now I feel as though I've found my place in the content creation industry. absolutely love that we have the sense of community that we do in Greater Manchester. That is just Greater Manchester though. It is a very community driven uh, place. So it kind of makes sense that that collaborative innovation would happen here and would happen well here. Many thanks for that uh, and thank you Andrew for your opening comments there. Apologies we had a bit of a glitch with the, uh, the the sound almost inevitable in a digital event to have a digital problem. I think it's it's almost compulsory. Uh, I think last year we had one or two glitches back in October as well. So thank you thank you so much uh, for that for those opening uh, opening comments Andrew um, and fantastic to have you back as our as our digital city region leader. So just to reflect on a few things before we move into that uh, Slido, a few Slido questions. And actually I wanted to pick up on uh, Saskia's comment there. You know, actually we have, you know, we have this, um, we're very fortunate in Greater Manchester that collaboration almost seems to be in our in our DNA. You know, we, we have this adage, um, you know, you'll, you'll be familiar with it, big enough to matter, small enough to know each other and driven enough to make things happen. And that does seem to be something about the sort of special source that, that makes Greater Manchester work, that opportunity, the ability for people to work together, look at opportunities to understand uh, how to join the dots and, and create things that are more than the sum of the parts. And we see that again and again across the, across the uh, uh, GM Tech Fund, some of the cyber work, uh, in in so many areas, and it and it is a real strength, and it's something we should all recognise and celebrate, and, and work to to build on uh, across you know industry, voluntary community sector, public sector, schools, colleges, academia, policing, fire health, and and, and everyone. So it, it is it is essential that we continue to do that, and whether or not that's virtually or face to face as we move forwards, and and as that blended approach evolves. Uh, as Andrew said, you know, the, the pandemic has highlighted that we live in a digital society now. And I'd argue that almost every organisation is now a digital organisation. Uh, uh, but that also creates challenges as well as opportunities. And part of what we'll do today is reflect on some of those challenges and how collectively we're, um, we're both seeking to address those challenges and, and move forward and, and, and take advantage of some of the opportunities that, that we have around us. Uh, but before we get into our into our speakers, let's just take a bit of an opportunity now to gather some valuable insights from everybody, if that's possible. And we'll be posting some questions using this tool called Slido, which hopefully you'll you'll see on screen uh, in a in a second uh, or two. And I think we're going to put some details in the in the chat as uh, as well uh, around this. Um, so Susie, I think, is just going to drop those in. Some of you will have used this before, and it's a really straightforward tool. 
Um, you can just hop over to slido.com. You can just scan the QR code with your phone on the screen and it'll just drop you straight into it. Um, and if you go over to slido.com, you just put in the hashtag digital city region uh, and then it'll it'll push up some of the questions. So I hope uh, hope that's OK. Uh, so and we're we're going to, um, as I say, post post the questions in, in the chat and the instructions in the chat, too. We we asked these are a set of questions we actually asked back in the Digitober event we did in, Octo uh, in October last year. And actually, we wanted to ask the same questions because it gives us an opportunity to see how the world has almost shifted. And it's it's, it's, it's a snapshot and it's a kind of, you know, a small view um, across uh, a subsection of, of obviously a wider community, but it's quite useful. So we wanted to pose the same questions we used in October last year as well and help us understand the kind of changing landscape that, that we work in. So the first question is, if, 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 uh, if people have managed to, to find them, get themselves onto Slido, and I see there's been some responses already, which of the following issues has affected your organisation the most so far during the pan pandemic? And which do you, do you expect to affect you most of the kind of next, the next six months as, as we move forward? And that staff culture and innovation is, is coming through really strongly in staffing levels, recruitment. OK, that's really interesting. So we'll just give a bit of time for people to to work through work through these. And that staff culture and innovation one is really fascinating. Funnily enough, we just like so many other organisations that you read about are having sessions looking at, well, what's the future of work? What's the, you know, the overused new normal phrase? What's that going to feel like and look like as we move to kind of blended ways of working? Uh, and, um, you know, in some sectors, there's, there's a real expectation of the return to the office, others um, not quite in the same boat. Um, and some of that's much more organisational than sector led. But it, you know, it, you know, we, you forget that in some ways the last year, so, you know, some of us, some people haven't, you know, interacted with many other people at all. So it is, uh, it's, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. This, and uh, I think one of the things we, you know, we see very clearly in our in our world is obviously we we work like this, you know, Teams, Zoom, and other tools almost continuously, uh, but. Uh, I think part of the question is how do you balance the, you know, the social interaction face to face with, um, with a kind of innovation culture support for new starters uh, and so on. So thank you. I think that's settled down a bit. Let's move on to the next question if that's OK. So Greater Manchester is committed to being a fully digitally enabled city region by 2023. So what does in this context for you, what does bridging the digital divide mean to you as a, as a digital leader? Uh, either within Greater Manchester or more broadly, if you're joining this session from outside Greater Manchester. That's interesting, accessibility coming through very strongly. I think that message about it's interesting that, that kind of language about not leaving anyone behind. It's interesting to see that come through inclusion. Absolutely. Some great comments in there. Just give it a few more seconds, I think. That's OK. OK, let's let's move on to the next one, if that's all right. And so based on your experience, you know, what are the most significant barriers to digital exclusion 
within that, almost reflecting that, that previous word cloud. Mm. really interesting mix which really highlights actually there's there's not you know there's not a silver bullet there never has been to addressing digital inclusion but it is a whole a whole range of factors and we'll be picking up on some of these later on on the agenda and we have a, a panel conversation around this specifically but i think this this is incredibly helpful and really useful to get this to get some of this feedback. OK, I think we might. Um, that's been really useful. And, and what we'll do is we'll compare the kind of responses that we had in October last year with these responses here uh, and just see how we uh, just see what the differences are and see if things have evolved um, and we'll feed that back through some of our some of you might already sign up to the monthly newsletter that we put out um, uh, and we'll reflect some of the, the you know the, the feedback uh, feedback through that so let's let's move forward if that's okay we've got now uh, a, our first of three panel short panel conversations and uh, I'm delighted to introduce LJ Woodward Becky Bibby and, and Kieran Smith. Uh, Becky's assistant director from Early Help and School Readiness in Salford. Kieran's from the Combined Authority for my team, Digital Program Manager, and LJ uh, is the locality lead for health and early intervention at Stockport Family. And um, we're going to be starting, we're having this conversation here about both empowering people and sort of innovative public services context. Uh, and we're going to start with with a session on a, on a really important priority area for Greater Manchester, which is school readiness and, and, uh, and some of the early work, early years work in the city region. Uh, and I know colleagues will talk about the scale of this challenge um, and how important it is for us, because actually if children don't start school right, then they, they risk not uh, being able to fulfil some of the opportunities that they, they could otherwise uh, um, um, uh, realise in, in their lives. So it's just so important uh, for us. Um, so I'm going to, if I can, just pile straight into this uh, into this next session, if that's OK. And if it's OK, just just pose my first question uh, to, to uh, uh, Becky and LJ. Which is what's the you know what's the scale? Just picking up on that, what's the scale of this challenge here in Greater Manchester when we when we talk about school readiness? I don't know who wants Becky, to go first. Hey, Becky, yeah. shall I shall I come in there? Of course, I'll do. All right, thanks, Becky. Thanks, Phil. Um, so, um, if we think back to pre-COVID and consider the data back in 2019, there was approximately 12,000 children in Greater Manchester that we wouldn't consider to have been starting school with the skills that they need to learn. So that was representing around a third of children in the city region. And we've already talked quite a bit about COVID, but the risks to securing good outcomes for our children in the earliest years of life will have been compounded by COVID and widening that inequalities gap. Um, and as you've already um, alluded to, Phil, there is a really strong collaborative ethos in Greater Manchester. And I think um, an example of which has been that approach to tackling the issue of school readiness, where we've had um, the 10 local authorities and other organisations working together to give children that very best start in life. Um, you know, we've got examples of um, the, the, the ambition for greater um, integration through the early years delivery model, which is providing a standardised framework. 
um, and supporting those timely assessment points for children in the early years, which is leading to that earlier identification of need. And then also we have underpinning the best practice pathways that are supporting that early intervention and effectiveness of our delivery. And just coming back to that collaboration and um, integration, integration and that place-based response, including building that community resource, so empowering our local communities and our local families, that is really fundamental to improving outcomes for children and young people. There isn't one service that can do it all. And actually services within the early years are not the ones that can just improve those outcomes for children in the early years of life. It's a system wide approach. So progressing that digitalization in the early years is a key enabler to empowering those families, developing more efficient and effective ways of working, the sharing of information to support those smoother transitions for children. And most importantly, families only having to tell their story once. And also it, it helps us um, to ensure the smarter use of data so that we can more effectively respond to need, unmet need, in a much more timely way. Um, Becky, is there anything you want to come in with there? I don't think so, LJ. I think I'd just say that I think we're really fortunate in Greater Manchester that actually school readiness is a priority, a priority at a Greater Manchester level and across the 10 localities. And I think the work around integration can be seen at that level as well. So I think the work around digitalisation, working the business, working with the digital team in GMCA just shows actually that we want to get this right. And we are looking um, to make sure that children do get the best start in life. Brilliant. Thank you so much, LJ and Becky. I think that sets the scene really well. And, and obviously it's been incredibly hard over the last well, 14 or so, 15, 16 months, isn't it, with the, with the pandemic and the impact that's had on health visiting, obviously, obviously a very personalised service as well. Uh, but, you know, kids obviously still uh, growing up during that during that time. And in, in many ways, this almost being more important uh, than ever. But, in, you know, in that context, so how, do, how can digital support the challenge and, and what's already being done in, in the city region? And maybe Becky and Kieran can look to you to, to respond to that. Yeah, should I start us off, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. That's great. So I think, you know, as I said before, I think, you know, we are fortunate that school readiness is a high priority, but I think we recognised quite early on that digitalisation was key to some of this as well. And I think the partnership between the business <laughs> around what we do at a kind of practical level and then how digital and digital solutions can support that um, is a real success in Greater Manchester. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, historically, and this won't be, this this isn't just for Greater Manchester, you know, early years is a very paper-based system across health visiting, across early years settings, you know, early help children centres. A lot of our assessments is done on paper, you know, and being able then to share that information, as LJ said before, um, make sure we've got um, interventions in place at a timely, um, you know, time is, is, is a challenge when you're working in, in a paper-based um, environment. So I think from a kind of, GM digital perspective, you know, the, the introduction of the early years app, um, which I think um, was around 2020, Kevin, if I'm correct, there, that we were kind of getting Sorry, into yeah. that launching of the app um, was absolutely key to moving us into the next phase for our school readiness programme. And I think the work prior to the launching of that um, has been absolutely fantastic, particularly around how we've um, developed the app um, from a kind of user perspective. So this app has been co-designed. So health visitors have been at the heart of um, designing what the application looks like. So we've concentrated to begin with on um, a health visiting perspective. So we've looked at assessments in that very early stages up until the age of two, two and a half. Um, and we've had pro professionals and practitioners supporting and co-designing what this digital application will look like. So we know that it's going to be effective. 
we know that it's going to be used. Parents have been involved in, in understanding what it means for them from their perspective, um, how they can look and do assessments from a parent's point of view. And then we're already seeing what the benefits of that is. LJ alluded to that before, better information sharing, more joint up working, enabling us to have that place-based offer in a neighbourhood, in a locality. Um, you know, even like having more quality time, health visitors are able to have more quality time. I suppose supporting families directly, not coming back and having to double entry um, assessment information into various systems. It, it absolutely is, is transforming the way we're working, you know, and, and it is an exciting place to be. That's brilliant. Thanks, Becky. Kieran, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah. Yeah, just to echo some of the points that Becky made, I mean, it really is transformative what, what we're doing with the early years application. It's probably worth noting as well that we're the first region nationally to get digital agreement, uh, digital copyright agreements, digitise the national ages and stages questionnaires, which have allowed us to unlock that data uh, and really do that digital transformation uh, across the region. So we're live in Berry and Rochdale at the moment, as Becky said, but looking to all that across the, across the other remaining eight localities. Um, and previous evaluation and assessment of the benefits has actually realised an efficiency of 30% uh, time efficiency on health visitors' time, meaning that we can actually uh, dedicate more time to those more complex cases and spending more time with families across Greater Manchester. It's probably also worth reflecting that the early years application is the first use case on the Great Manchester Digital Platform, um, which is a significant programme of digital transformation, digital capabilities that allow us to, to um, fulfil our ambitious um, digital transformation programme across Greater Manchester. That's brilliant. Well, listen, thank you. Uh, let's keep going. We've got another, another one of the question. I think it's probably more looking forwards with some of this because I think we've done the kind of, you know, the, the clear need in this space, the work that, that, that's happening. How is it? You know, what's next for this kind of digital transformation of, of this type in the city region? And I know this is just one element we're looking at. There's a huge amount happening up, happening uh, in, in so many different areas. But perhaps uh, Kieran, Becky, you could you could comment on that as well. Yeah, so if I can come in first on that one, yes, yeah, so really echo that, Phil. The early years app is really just the tip of a very ambitious so iceberg of digital transformation that we've got across Greater Manchester. So early years, as we're saying, focusing on health visiting to start with, but actually we're actually expanding the application into um, local authority early year settings, so nurseries. And what that provides us with is a, a way we can automate the sharing of data, meaning that actually the outcomes of health assessments are actually visible to local authority professionals as well, which doing that in a more automated, consistent way, so support needs are more um, earlier identified. We've also used the wider components of the digital platform to integrate international databases, so we're looking to integrate into the NHS database, meaning we can um, have an automated flow of data around new births, child deaths, movements into the region, which is obviously critical as well. Um, and also how we can integrate the application into existing systems, recognising that actually you know, there's a wide, diverse um, landscape of different systems, different different levels of digital and data maturity across the region, um, using the wider components of the digital platform to supplement that and achieve consistent outcomes across, across the different localities. Um, sorry, Becky, are you going to come in there? I was just going to say, just from a very business, business perspective, um, you know, I think Kevin kind of alluded that we are looking at um, assessments in nurseries as well, but in schools. So schools are able, so we're kind of focusing on speech, language and communication, which is an area um, where we are focusing a lot of our, um, I suppose, pathway development at a GM level. And actually, you know, being able to um, get direct assessment data from schools, early year settings around children's language development. It will give us, um, it's transformational in itself, it will help us start to do that early identification of need. We can start to then put the right resources in and the right interventions at a, at a much earlier stage, which is absolutely where we need to be. We need to be making sure we're getting in there at the earliest opportunity. And Phil, you'll know, I've got a massive list where we can take this to the next level. You know, <laughs> Phil's aware of my ever asking list, but you know, this is the start of something. And I think, you know, as we continue to develop this, the opportunities for, you know, understanding children, being able to intervene earlier 
and actually having a child's journey from conception to the age of five it is something um you know to be really kind of it well it's very transformational it's really transformational and you know and i honestly believe we can do that thank thank you so much karen did you want to come back in i think yeah just one more sorry yeah, just one on. more final point from me is yeah so we talked about the digital platform as well and early is obviously is the focus but we're looking at how we can use this technology in other areas of reform and transformation as well looking at homelessness and um, victims of crime and supported families as well to understand how we can bring data together and actually use it at the operational level as, as uh, becky was alluding to there but also analytical so we can look at commissioning patterns and making sure you no know, we're doing the best across greater manchester with our data. Oh, thanks so much, Kieran. And just actually on that as well is that there's obviously a lot of um, to, uh, uh, conversation at a national level around e-read book and and some of that potential. Is that something that comes into this agenda as well? It, it does. Really Phil. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, digital personal child health record. So it's part of the work that um, Andrea Ledson's doing. They're looking to roll out digital versions of the Red Book from 2023. Um, what we want to do in, in Greater Manchester is understand if it, can, can we do this once across the region? Can we create a product that is um, you know, one product for parents and carers in the early year space that is parent carer facing and it's like a one stop shop for for their digital access and, 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 and data data capture. So we're looking at and exploring how we can build on the capabilities we've got already in the digital platform um, to improve um, the way we offer digital services to, to citizens of Greater Manchester. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And I think coming back to something that LJ said right at the start as well, uh, that, that place-based element, people often, you know, children go to school across boundaries, they go to nursery settings across boundaries and they get they follow their, you know, where people take their children to nurseries near where they work. So it, it, you know, having that cross boundary approach and ability to for, for, to work at a GM level is, has been so important in this. But it also feels just coming back to the point that, that Becky made uh, as well. The fact that it's so user led and it's so, you know, this has been this has not been tech for tech's sake. This is about actually working with professionals to try and do something that really makes an impact. So. It's definitely not tech for tech's sake, and I'm I'm the thorn in Kieran's side. It's that you know, and that's been really important, Phil. And I just think it demonstrates the strong relationships actually across the kind of tech side and the business side. And there's been, I know it's linked into work with the BBC's Tiny Happy People and those sort of elements. Is it worth just talking about some of those other development tools? Just touching on those briefly. Yeah, so uh, just to pick up and then if uh, Becky or I do want to come in on that. So yeah, so as you said there, BBC, we've got an agreement with BBC to put their content into the early years application. We're working with a company called Essential Parent, um, who are based out of Cambridge, who have um, a really um, you know, rich um, content library, or, um, a digital content library, and we're looking to integrate the early years application into that to create a seamless experience for, for users, so health visitors don't have to log into multiple different systems. Um, and we're so we're working with um, the copyright holders for the form, so ASQ, and we've got Welcome in there with GL Assessment. So just creating a really rich product that isn't just for assessment capture, it's actually there for the parent to use, can access videos that are appropriate to the developmental age of the child, and just creating something that, that's really um, rich and, and user-friendly at the heart of it. Uh, listen, that's absolutely fantastic, and I, and I know there's a lot of interest at a national level and from other parts of the UK, from other local authorities and, and um, places in this work as well. Um, which is, you know, we were always keen to share because we're always keen to learn from other places as well. And as you mentioned, we'll even use things from companies developed in Cambridge. So uh, <laughs> positively, positively outward looking. <laughs> Should we, uh, I might, we might just draw that to a close then at that point. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the time today. Gives, you know, hopes give people a snapshot of just one of the, one of the areas of work, but a really critical and important area for, for us all in in Greater Manchester and as you know you highlighted in the, in the stats at the opening you know 12,000 roughly 12,000 kids 12,000 children every year joining you know starting year one from reception that aren't meeting you know aren't at a good level of development and that is really really fundamental uh, and the best opportunity we have is you know those early stages the first three years and without the data without the ways of working we're not going to make a difference in in so far as we could be in that context so uh, I think that was really powerful. So, so thank you, thank you so much for for, for the time today. Thanks, Phil. Okay.
let's let's move on if that's okay we're going to go uh, sideways slightly to a totally different kind of um, conversation but obviously heavily linked and we're going to just spend a little bit of time talking about world-class digital infrastructure which is really fundamental and as we kind of think about our sort of digital canvas in in greater manchester connectivity is, is just fundamental and there's so much in the press about connectivity uh, or you know at the moment 4g 5g full fiber uh, and so on it's a it's a really exciting time around this and there's some really really exciting innovation happening in greater manchester uh, in this in this space uh, one of the things that's happening at the moment is we're working with Virgin Media, building out about 2,700 kilometres of new fibre cabling in the, the largest government funded programme in, in the UK, connecting about 1,500 public sites, schools, libraries, council offices, hospitals, community centres, and across our traffic management signals as well, which uh, are complementing additional work in, in, in Thameside, Manchester and Salford. But the potential around that is really, really interesting. Uh, and despite COVID and the, you know the, the challenges of getting into sites it's physical work going to sites actually made massive progress uh, on this and we also know from some of the initial work that's been done about the economic benefits locally already from from that initial work is over 12 million uh, in Greater Manchester and just set to grow so uh, we'll touch on uh, perhaps some of the social value work that's been happening in Greater Manchester but really to unpack this a bit more I'd like to introduce Three, three of my colleagues, um, Martin McFadden, Head of uh, Public se uh, Sector for Virgin Media O2 Business, the new combined uh, Virgin Media O2 joint venture in the UK, uh, only recently uh, announced. John Rooney, the Assistant Director of Information, Customers and Communities at Rochdale uh, Borough Council, and John Burt from the GMCA, the lead enterprise architect. Uh, so welcome, uh, welcome guys. Thank you very much for making the, the time today. Um, let's uh, let's just start with the kind of big picture on this a bit. You know, I'm sure most people on this call are kind of aware of the benefits that that good connectivity and, and particularly full fibre can can bring. And in Greater Manchester, we're we're starting to see further benefits unlocked. But you know, what does this look like, and and, and why is it why is it important? Why should we care in 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 our region? So. Uh, uh, I've got two Johns. This is going to cause cause me problems. So, John B and John and John Rooney. So, uh, can I come to you first and, and ask for your your perspectives on this? I'm not sure which order you want to take it. You want to go first, John B? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so, I think you know the pandemic's shown one thing that the increased requirements for connectivity across the board. You know, as we've become more online, you know, digital only works with, with good connectivity, and. When we started the full fibre programme, we really seen it as a really as a foundational project for enabling that kind of smart city capability across the region. Hence, the reason we're not just looking at buildings; we're also looking at those urban traffic control signals as as potential nodes for a smart city region capability. And what we're doing at the moment, uh, along with uh, Rochdale and three other local authorities and transport for Greater Manchester, is is looking at uh, something called GM1 Network, which it's a single platform, network platform across those full fibre sites initially uh, to look at uh, as a transformation capability. Um, so GM1's out as a procurement activity at the moment, but really that's just the start of it. What we really want to see is, is building upon the great work that's happening with that full fibre programme, like extending it out and building on top of a bit with things like uh, potentially in the future advanced wireless capability which incorporates things like 5G, uh, developing on the project that uh, TFGM are leading on with uh, the traffic uh, intelligent traffic control system that's using um, 5G to connect up all the different traffic control signals down the A6 in, in Salford to use artificial intelligence in the cloud rather than locally to actually alter the pattern of traffic control signals improving journey times. I'm looking at scaling that out and then interfacing into some of the other projects that happen across the region, things like CCTV, clean air zones, um, but then also looking at can we use these platforms as a capability to improve digital inclusion across the region, um, whether that you know, as, a, as an aspirational piece um, and, and tying into that mayoral priority. Thanks, John. Uh, John, John R, do you want to talk about this a little bit from a, a Rochdale perspective? 
Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, really, I think John summed it up really well, is we know what the financial benefits are going to be by collaborating and making this investment. Uh, I think what we've got is a great potential. So actually having those discussions with people, those colleagues, where we can address issues like this, massive issues such as climate change, where we look at those issues about inequalities and in skills, that's the real potential for this project. So I think the opportunities are endless, but we've got as a commitment, you mentioned, you know, we've got collaboration in our DNA, Bill, which is absolutely right. But we've got to keep that message, that discussion going about how we can build on these investments going forward and also how we can join up because we talk about joint systems, but we've got to have that joint trust and those relationships to make those systems work. And the system's one thing, but we've got to make sure that the, the rest of the public service reform agenda works alongside this. And again, we are an enabler we've, and those relationships that people have mentioned earlier are absolutely fundamental to this success. Absolutely. And, and the potential in that space extends to, all, to, to some of the challenges we have around digital inclusion and a whole variety of other uh, or other elements as well. If I could just move on, if that's okay. So one of the one of the things we reflect on a lot is is you know our digital infrastructure efforts see us working really closely with partners, and it's almost picking up on that point you just made, John, about that need for collaboration. But you know, it'd be good to just unpack that a bit more and and reflect on why why that's you know so important. So if I could come back to you again, John and and uh, John R and, and Martin, bring Martin in on this from a Virgin perspective. Obviously, who we work with very closely. Thank you. I'll, I'll just start there. I mean, I'm, I just, as I said, I'm, I'm very proud to say I've worked my whole career in Greater Manchester. I also think we're very lucky to have the combined authority. And this is a bit of a, a big thank you to you, Phil and John, and all your team, because you've done a brilliant job in bringing us all together on this massive project where we've got the combined authority, the local authorities in Greater Manchester. This is on the full fibre element, fire and rescue service, and uh, transport for Greater Manchester. So it's, it's a massive project to. To collaborate and build those relationships and actually uh, knit it all together and actually be, have one common goal of what we want to do have clear outcomes and for me it's there's three elements of this there's stuff around the what we're doing around reforming our services we do as a partnership it's the element of for our citizens and also for our businesses and in practical terms that public service reform journey that we've all mentioned is so crucial mm. so we mentioned we, you're all aware of the establishment of neighbor teams across greater manchester we're establishing six within our borough of Rochdale, where we're bringing health professionals and council staff together in co-locations, but it's also making sure that they have a common focus of how they're going to work. And this will need joined up networks and systems. So GM1, which John mentioned, will give us that opportunity, of one network connection for a building. And that basically really helps us, it reduces costs, it supports integration, and ultimately improves um, our outcomes for citizens, which we're all here to do. And that's that's what's really fundamental. And that's a selling point to politicians and everyone else. So, I mean, the other thing that we've talked about is COVID as well. And I think this investment will also assist our next phase of place based working and also our COVID recovery as well to really make sure that we have a single view and those those relationships are stronger. And now we've got the systems, hopefully, that will that will make that possible. So in terms of benefits for residents, you mentioned some of these already, but in a local level in Rochdale, uh, high speed broadband at the moment, we, we think, and again, GM think that this is an essential utility for our residents. And across the borough, uh, we expect super fast broadband to increase from around 2% now, it's just 2% to around 28% when this is complete. It's a massive change, a massive boost. It's a turbocharge really in terms of opportunity. And we still have some pockets of poor connectivity across Greater Manchester, you know, within Rochdale and Wigan and other areas. And this will really help those people who are digitally excluded. But will also help those many people that, like ourselves, who are often working from home, are studying from home and will continue to do so. And it's absolutely essential that we, we do that for our residents. And the third area which I met reference was around businesses. And when we looked at this project together, by, by looking at across um, geographic boundaries, we can actually see those opportunities for growth and where that investment is required. Uh, for example, within between Bury and Rochdale, we've got the Northern Gateway development, and we've been working on a major scheme which will bring around 6,000 jobs and 6,500 new homes. And as part of that, we need good quality, high quality infrastructure, you know, roads, transport, and so on. So having this investment, this uh, digital investment nearby allows us to plan around that and also it's a massive incentive to new businesses who want to come 
to the north of the conurbation. I can see that infrastructure that we're providing as a real incentive is a necessity for them for the future so that we have those quality jobs that we're going to need uh, when the pandemic's finished. And again, it's not just about those growth opportunities, it's about those many smaller businesses and individual home workers who are working from home. It's something that we have a right to do and it, I think it will really benefit those people. And as you said earlier, we don't always talk about it, but it's, but it's really important that we crow about this and we actually see what the opportunities are and tell people what the opportunities are for them that's going to come from this fantastic investment. That's fantastic. Thanks, John. I wonder if I could bring in Martin on, on that point as well. Yeah, thanks, Phil, um, and, and thanks for the uh, inclusion today. Um, I, I think in, on the subject of, of partnerships and partnership working, um, uh, just to, to kind of repeat a couple of points you made at the start, we are embarking and we're delivering the largest government-funded full-fibre network infrastructure programme across Greater Manchester. And that's to deliver 2,700 kilometres of fibre to over 1,500 public sector sites. You can't do that on your own. You need collaboration, you need partnership working, and you need people to come together to make that happen. Whether it's for the, the procurement from the outset or for the planning, the access, the way leaves, and all the other good stuff that goes on around the delivery of the programme. And it's critically important that the partnership is there. And that's something that has been fantastic to see through uh, the whole life of the, uh, of the project between ourselves and GMCA. But in addition to that, it's not just about the infrastructure as a standalone. And it's about re really understanding the role of place and community uh, as part of what's really important. Because the infrastructure is an enabler, but an enabler to what? And it's if you don't understand what it's enabling, then it's almost a meaningless exercise as far as I'm concerned. And what we know through the great work we've been doing with GMCA and all the affiliate organisations across the, the boroughs and fire service and health and so on, is that we know that Greater Manchester has the desire to be one of the best places in the world to grow up, get on and grow old. And infrastructure and digital plays a massive role in enabling that to happen. And through the engagement that we've had, we know that the priorities for, for, for Greater Manchester are around homelessness around Greater Manchester's young people, around the voluntary sector and how that can support all of the initiatives across the, the city region, around how the public sector can collaborate better and about how we can drive improvement in the skills and increasing the employment opportunities for the future. And kind of, I guess, dipping back into the comments from LJ and Becky earlier on around the 12,000 children, we shouldn't lose sight of, they are the workforce of the future. And therefore, it is critically important that, yes, we want to make sure that they are ready to go to school, but we also want to make sure that they are fit for the workforce of the future in order to sustain a long term benefit to the region. So the importance of the partnership and the collaborative working is around understanding what's important. The education is important. Inclusion, both social and digital inclusion is important. And the collaboration, both public and private sector, is critically important. And the demographics vary across the city, they vary across the country, and, and it's really important that we understand how the application of technology and digital can advantage everybody involved. And it's fantastic to see such a great collaboration across Greater Manchester and with Virgin Media Business and your other partners, because that's not something that we see nationally across the country in the role that I have the pleasure of doing. And as a result of that, we have learned a phenomenal amount by working with Greater Manchester. We have evolved our own business approach around how we approach social value. And that has delivered fantastic benefits to us as an organization as a direct result of that. So it's a mutually beneficial partnership and one that we should not lose sight of and want to continue to build on and grow. Thanks very much, Martin. I think that Funnily enough, that echoes back to, to, to something we said at the start, and, and, and John R., I think you really brought that to life with some of the examples in, in Rochdale in terms of the multi-agency working and actually the difference that can make to people and places. And, you know, we do bang on about this, but it isn't tech for tech's sake. You know, this is, you know, it, and, and that kind of, again, again, it's kind of that kind of collaborate to innovate kind of message is just so central to, to so much of, of what we're doing. I'm just mindful slightly of time, so we might have to be quite brief on this uh, this last this last question. I think we've answered some of this already, but in terms of our digital infrastructure ambitions, you know, we do have such a strong emphasis on tangible benefits to people 
uh, beyond just the kind of, you know, and the connectivity bits, which we, we talked about. And I think we've touched on that. I mean, any final, just final comments or words that you might add uh, from all three, in fact, if, if uh, you just want to make any final statements just as we wrap up this, this, uh, this section? If I if I can kind of open up, Phil, what we're what we're seeing nationally is people looking at new metrics to how the, the digital infrastructure enablement allows better ways of working, uh, and and some of those metrics have been around. We did a recent event with a number of NHS organisations where they were talking to reduced admissions um, in across hospitals, quicker to get patients home to the environment they want to be in as part of their rehabilitation, and how digital has enabled that. And the output of some of that has meant that they've been able to draw uh, kind of an analysis that says fewer road miles are being driven for people to get to hospital or GPs appointments. Therefore, there's less maintenance requirements on the roads infrastructure that's around uh, their region. And importantly, there's a massive reduction in the uh, carbon uh, emissions as a direct result of all of that as well. So there, there's a lot of real advantages that can be gleaned from from the infrastructure that we don't necessarily just associate with uh, on a you know, day to day basis. Yeah, that's really useful thinking as well, and the, and the environmental aspect is is just huge. I just wanted to ask John or John or John, is there any final comments you want to make just as we wrap this this section up? I'm conscious we're up against it. Time, yeah, time just, just a quick one for me, Phil. It was just really uh, reinforcing the fact that this investment we're doing is a starting point how we deliver it and how we, it benefits our communities, our businesses and our partnerships are down to that ongoing dialogue. So that's really crucial over the next few years. We keep that focus. We look at the opportunities that are going to come and we actually have those ambitions and we have the best digital offer that we can provide to our citizens. Absolutely. Uh, I think we might need to just to wrap that uh, that point up there, if, that, if that's all right. Unless John B, you've got a final snappy few words you want to drop in or are we happy to wrap that bit? Up at that point. I think the guys have covered most of it, so yeah, interesting time. Let's move on. Interesting times indeed, yeah, and a lot of ambition. So thank you so much for the time uh, today around this. It's just such an important agenda, and uh, uh, and where we have a huge amount happening. Thanks very much, uh, guys, and let's uh, we'll move on now to our uh, our final uh, panel session before we introduce uh, the mayor. Uh, so in the final session here, we're going to be talking about people at the the heart of of what we do. And just to introduce this, uh, well, before I introduce uh, our three panellists who are Adam Micklethwaite, uh, the Director of Social Inclusion Good Things Foundation, Adele Reynolds, Principal Skills Manager at the CA, and Claire Fenwig's Locality and Digital Inclusion Service Manager at, at Salford. J you know, just in terms of the context of this, people at the heart of what we do is such a such an important message from a, from a digital agenda perspective. Um, and we do want to, I mean, we talk about the fact we want to make sure that everyone in Greater Manchester, wherever their age, location or situation, can benefit from the opportunities digital brings. Uh, uh, and we've touched on quite a lot of that already, actually, through this um, through this agenda. But as we talked about this morning, and when I, when I, sorry, earlier when I, when I started, you know, a huge number of people are very challenged by a more digital society and are, find themselves on the wrong side of the, of the digital divide. Uh, and the scale of this challenge is, is really significant. And we know that in Greater Manchester alone, there's as many as 1.2 million of our residents are partially digitally excluded in, in some manner across all age groups for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that the benefits of digital can bring and addressing, uh, it, it, you know, um, um, are not being fully realised, those people. And that's a serious priority uh, for us, which I know the mayor will talk about. Uh, shortly as well. So let's just let's just kind of open that up and particularly to Adam and Claire in the first instance. You know, how important is it that organisations across all, se all sectors commit to, to, to helping address the, the digital divide? I don't know who Should wants I... to go first. Is that all right? Yeah, are you going first, Adam? Yeah, OK. Um, thanks, Phil. So, so as you said, digital exclusion is, is a big issue um, and it needs a response at scale. Um, if you just look nationally, you see 9 million people still unable to use the internet independently without support. 6% um, of households don't have internet access. 14% of adults are infrequent internet users. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. This is a big problem um, and it affects people very severely. Um, digital exclusion affects people in many different ways. Um, and we saw that in the Slido poll right at the start. It could be a lack of devices for children and their families. 
Uh, it could be gaps in digital skills affecting people who are seeking work. Um, it could be being socially isolated by not being able to connect with others online. Um, and of course, many people need intensive support to build their digital confidence and skills. And that, that's because digital exclusion is much more likely to affect people who are already facing barriers um, associated with social exclusion. Um, people on low incomes are 40% less likely to have basic digital skills than people on higher incomes. Um, so for all of those reasons, digital uh, fixing the digital divide is bigger than the job of just one organization. Um, it needs action from a wide range of organizations that support different audiences. Um, the community sector obviously plays a really key role and libraries do too. Um, but also local and combined authorities, uh, employers, job centres, FE colleges, some of the great services that we've seen that support families and children. Um, everybody needs to play their part. Um, so we need action from a wide range of organisations. And we, we also need an ambitious plan that mobilises and maintains that support um, in a really strong cross sector push. And that's why it's brilliant, we think, to see um, the Digital Inclusion Task Force that GM, GM have set up. Um, which has such a wide and, and deep membership from across the city, really tapping into that um, community spirit, Phil, that you were talking about earlier on. Um, and it provides a really excellent way to create the energy we need for cross-sector action. So it's really important that we all step up and all work together to try and fix the digital divide here in GM and indeed nationally. Thanks, Adam. Claire, did you want to come in on that and talk reflect a little, perhaps a little bit on the, the huge amount of work that's happened in Salford already around this and how it's moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Is it important for us to work together? Uh, hugely important. We can't do it alone. And, you know, from a Salford perspective, we've certainly seen how COVID has impacted on people's lives and communities um, in accessing really important services. Um, and it's accelerated, but certainly transformed the way that we're delivering our services in Salford. So before the pandemic, we've got a digital providers network in Salford and they've played a huge role in supporting residents over the last 15 months. So we've got over 40 agencies that are signed up to that partnership in Salford and that includes private, public, voluntary and community sector. So it's really important that everybody's working together and the things that, the, you know, that partnership has achieved on the ground is phenomenal. They've created a single front door partnership website in Salford uh, for all things digital inclusion uh, and delivered various projects. So I think just to summarise, we live, we work and we're supporting the same people, we're working in the same communities, we've got the shared same ambitions. And I think now more than ever, it's, in, you know, it's massively important to continue to work together to ensure that nobody's left behind. Um, we have to work together, we have to share good practice, and we have to ensure that our residents are receiving those tangible benefits. I think, you know, there's lots of innovation, there's more exciting opportunities to come in Salford, and absolutely everybody needs to be on that, that journey together. Yeah, so for me, hugely important. That's fantastic, Claire. Um, thanks, Adam. It really brings brings the whole agenda to life. And that point about actually it's all the same people, uh, either because it's a, of poverty or because of you know other factors that is uh, is, is challenging those individuals, um, that it does bring that focus together. And that point about the number of agencies there. I mean, let's if we could just pick up on that a bit more, perhaps in the, in, in the next question, which is you know, what you know what. Maybe you could unpack that, you know, what's that commitment look like in Greater Manchester a bit more and, and how are we ensuring real action in, in, in this space? And I would like to bring Adele in if we could first on this and then um, and then Claire, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you, Phil. So Adam's already mentioned the Digital Inclusion Task Force, which we launched last October. So that brings a huge number of partners from kind of health, public sector, voluntary sector, um, schools, all coming together around that joint ambition of 100% digital enablement and fixing the digital divide. And all of those partners share that common commitment to addressing those very interrelated issues around connectivity, affordability, skills, and really important issues around motivation and confidence as well. And that task force is a real kind of it's not a talking shop, it's getting on and doing. So one of the really early outcomes from that task force has been the Greater Manchester Tech Fund, which we set up um, with our local authorities actually and with business during the first um, COVID pandemic. And then it's been reinvigorated again recently 
to really make sure that um, we were helping young people to continue that education online um, and that they weren't being disadvantaged by lack of access to kit and connectivity. So with the brilliant support of the likes of Virgin Media, AO, Greater Manchester Police, we've been able to support over 3,000 young people to stay connected. And for me, that's what local action means because some of our most disadvantaged young people, up to around 20,000, were missing out on that DfE support. But we led that call to action with businesses, supported by the mayor, supported by our leaders. And we talked to our schools and colleges and we got that support at pace to where it was needed. And I think it's important to say as well that we're not just about kind of helping more people. We're trying to do something sustainable so we've set up the task force the mayor will talk more about um the action network that's been established shortly but we've also invested very heavily in a place-based approach to digital inclusion so we've used funding like adult education budget like our local growth fund to pump prime one and a half million pounds into our local authorities to support some of their local activity. And I'm sure Claire can um, touch on some of the brilliant um, work that's been done in Salford. And our work around digital inclusion is very much providing the foundation to develop that thriving talent pipeline for the tech sector and making Greater Manchester that kind of really key place. I mean, nationally, hopefully internationally, for businesses that want to come and invest here because they can get that fantastic skilled workforce. Absolutely, absolutely. And that, and that is one of the key reasons we see businesses coming to Greater Manchester and we want those opportunities for people wherever they are in Greater Manchester uh, to be able to, to make the most of, of rewarding careers in that, uh, in that space. Um, Claire, did you want to come in on that a bit and talk about the Salford? kind of element again because it, yeah, it brings it to life yeah yeah thanks phil um so what does it look like in salford um and how are we sort you know supporting gm uh, wide ambitions and salford's you know because in salford we want to make sure that everyone can benefit from you know the 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 the, the opportunities that digital brings. So I'll just tell you about some of the things that we're doing and it very much links into uh, what Adele is saying really. So Karen Snape is our digital inclusion manager at Salford Council and she works very closely with GM um, and is very much of the, you know, the GM task force um, that we have those clear shared ambitions for. Um, as Adele mentioned again with the GM Tech Fund, we've been able to provide over you know 500 tablets to people who need them most around education, skills, and social social isolation. But I think you know the fantastic thing is and the infrastructure in Salford is because we have the digital providers network. Not only can we provide the tech, we can provide the wraparound support for the skills um, and training as well um, and connectivity so that people are uh, confident and comfortable and can afford to be able to use the kit that we've been able to provide. Um, we've worked and then led on um, creating a digital risk index in Salford that allows us to take a, a more data-led approach uh, and reach customers who need our help and support most. Um, that has been, you know, taken on, supported by uh, GM and, and now we're looking at how that can be rolled out to other local authorities. Of course, we've got our amazing facilities at Media City and host combine, you know, the skills, the innovation and startups all under one roof, uh, which really humanises technology uh, and also brings that out to our communities as well. Our mission is very much about breaking down the barriers to getting into, into the tech sector, inspiring our young people uh, and also helping them think about a career in digital and giving them the skills and the confidence to be able to do it as well. Certainly working with our online centres, we're talking to residents, understanding what the barriers are on the ground and, you know, what we can do to address them. And obviously having GM and support there and having routes to be able to escalate and share those problems is, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, just to finish on that, I hosted um, Salford's uh, Digital Providers Network Forum this morning, um, which was really great. So if you do get a chance, check it out. Absolutely. Thank you very much. A good, great plug, Claire. Um, I'm conscious of time, but let's whiz into our last question. If that's, uh, we might, if that's okay, we might have to be quite brief in, in some of the answers. I mean, one of the big challenges around this whole agenda is that obviously there's been a huge dive around the digital inclusion during the pandemic, but how do we make sure that this is sustained 
it's not just that flash in the pan because it's a systemic issue and it's not going away. So, uh, Adam, perhaps if you want to come in first, just to, a few thoughts. Yeah, of course. So, so COVID has transformed the world. Obviously, we've seen what we think is around 10 years of acceleration and digitization in a year. Um, and together with lockdown and social restrictions, that's that's really exposed digital exclusion very starkly, as we've seen. It's been an issue that, that was that was big, but maybe a bit little more behind the scenes in the past. And, and now it's visible um, and acute everywhere. People locked out of using essential services, people unable to stay connected to their loved ones. Um, and in some cases, people being forced to choose between food and data, which is simply unacceptable um, right. in the world in which we live. Um, and these aren't marginal problems, obviously. This, this can be devastating and have, have really deep consequences on people's lives. And digital transformation isn't going to stop. So this gap is only going to get worse without bold action and investment. So in that context, um, as a national digital inclusion charity, but also as an organisation that's, that's delighted to be able to support in GM, um, we think we need a big commitment. We need something that's ambitious and something that's long term in order to um, make a difference here. And that's exactly what we're seeing in GM, which is fantastic. So the commitment to 100% digitally enabled city region, um, the mayor's commitments in the, in the manifesto, um, it's vital that we harness the energy and the power of these commitments to turn that into sustained action. I know the mayor will be saying more about that shortly. Um, it's going to take prioritisation. You know, we can't take our eye off this ball. It needs to stay high in the in the in the in the prioritisation list. Um, it's going to need some investment. Uh, it's going to need that commitment to keep going. Um, and it's going to need a lot of sharing of best practice, which, as I say, the, the task force and other things that are happening in GM really allows us to do. Um, so we do need that sustained response, but building it on the back of those commitments and that fantastic, fantastic ambition is a brilliant place to start. Fantastic. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm really conscious we're slightly up against it time wise. Any final comments or words from Adele, Claire? Oh, only from me can only reiterate, um, you know, everything that Adam's just said. Um, it's important that we lead on this. It's important that we're deliberate about it. Um, and, and Salford totally, you know, is 100 behind that and, and supports it. Brilliant. Thank you. Should we draw that one to a close then at that at that point? And also, thank you so much. And I think you know, really brought that section to life and, and why this whole agenda is so critical and why people are at the heart of everything uh, we do uh, from a digital perspective, which I hope people get the sense that is, is, is run right the way through this session, whether or not we're talking about school readiness or even you know, our digital infrastructure, it's about people and what we can do differently and how we help people and create opportunities for people in, in Greater Manchester. So finally, um, I'd like to introduce our final speaker of the day, uh, who's very kindly made uh, time for us uh, in this uh, in his extremely hectic schedule, which I think all, you know reflects the importance of this agenda uh, uh, in Greater Manchester. So I'd like to introduce now Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester, who just built on some of those thoughts uh, we've just been talking about. Over to you, Andy. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much indeed, uh, Phil. Sounds like it's been a, a brilliant, uh, a brilliant afternoon actually, and good to follow on from uh, from from the previous uh, previous session. Just going to close things here, just so I've got yeah. Um, Phil, I thought I'd just take a moment at the start to just recap how much we've achieved really in the last um, in the last few years, because I think it's almost four years exactly since we had our first digital summit. Uh, post the first mayoral election. It's almost exactly four years, yeah. Almost exactly four years and I don't know if many people on this call today were there but certainly um, I, I uh, uh, Phil lost a bit more of his hair as a result of bringing that together in a case of two weeks I think or whatever it was when we threw that together but it was a great event actually. I remember there being a fantastic atmosphere there and I, I pushed you if you remember Phil to set new ambitions, big ambitions that UK's leading digital city region, uh, top five in Europe. And honestly, I, I can't quite believe how far we've come in that time on infrastructure, on inward investment, um, on skills. Um, but inclusion, yes, we've made progress. And um, absolutely, I would be the first to say Salford City Council, one of our, our leaders in, in that regard. Uh, but I think this is a moment now to, to raise our ambitions. You know. If you go back a year or more when we launched the blueprint, which was obviously trying to take us through this this next phase of our development, I don't think we could have imagined, could we, what was what, what was about to happen when we all gathered to, to launch that to blueprint. And what the last 14, 16 months has shown us is that the digital world is here and it's now and it's not going away in any way, shape or form. And we have to get 
more ambitious for our residents in terms of their access uh, to the digital world because it's where the conversation is happening. And if they are not connected to that conversation, they are isolated and you know they are not, not able to take, take a full part. But it's also where young people can find opportunity, friendship. Um, it's where older people can, can um, uh, find support. Uh, it's about access to public services. So where I've got to fill with all of this is if we are going to be the UK's leading digital city region, that just isn't an, industri an industrial statement. That is a social statement as well. And we should be the uh, the leader when it comes to what we expect in terms of people's entitlement to access the digital world. And it was basically in the middle of the first lockdown last year where our disabled people's panel uh, did um, a survey of all disabled people in Greater Manchester. I think about 7,000 people responded. I was actually quite shocked, um, picking up on Adam's point that he just made, how much people were struggling to afford their online access and we're making kind of compromises between you know as adam said food or you know uh, or utilities this has got to become the next utility hasn't it they can't this is a basic it's got to be a human right and i think that's the statement that's got to come out from greater manchester all of our all of our residents should be supported online because uh, if they are not online they are missing out on lots of things they are not able to fulfill um, their potential, or or have that have that life that we would want for for everybody, and and that's where we are now. I think post pandemic, and hence the manifesto that I just brought forward, Phil, which really tried to sort of set some new ambition in this space. Digital inclusion, in my experience, in in the world of you know pu public governance, it was always the nice to have, but the last on the agenda, and it's now got to move. I think to the first on the agenda. You know, if you're truly going to be a leading digital city region, I think you have to have a, a big statement about having all of your residents uh, online. Mm -hmm. So in the manifesto for the last mayoral election, the one just gone, I made a commitment to helping all under 25s, all over 75s and all disabled people online. Now, it does sound like a very big and ambitious statement and some might say, is it achievable? But actually, what's the consequences of not achieving it? It's more social isolation. It's younger people um, cut off from opportunity. Um, it's disabled people not, access, not able to access support. Or actually, if you look at some of what disabled people have said over the last uh, year, for those who do have online access, they've say, say it's been tran transformative in terms of their life, in terms of being able to attend business meetings and, and, and not have all of the, the hassle that comes with being forced to attend meetings in person. So you know, there's a real moment in time here where we can be a leader in saying what we think is right for the country, but actually do it in Greater Manchester. And while it is ambitious, I believe there are enough devices in this city region for everybody to have one. So I don't think it is unreasonable for me to say to organisations in the public, private, voluntary, other sectors, come on, you can recycle your devices to get them around and get, get one in the hands of everybody. Um, I think what we did see, of course, with the issue around schools was just it kind of when the tide went out on digital inclusion in schools, when, you know, when, when kids had to do all that home learning, I think we realised just how many of our young people in the city region struggle to access not just a device at home, but, but also data on an everyday basis. And it's not good enough to say, well, there's one in the home, therefore four kids can share it. You cannot learn in that, in, in that way. And therefore, it is about empowering every every individual. So alongside the device, Phil, of course, there's the, there's the data, as, as Adam was, was saying. But again, we've got big tech players here. Surely there's things that can be done to, to open up affordable uh, data for people. We've got public Wi-Fi as an option. You know, we've got obviously organizations that have um, uh, that could open up some of that access to their to their Wi-Fi. So there are I think there are solutions here. And then when we look at the whole question of, of digital skills, we've got the potential, obviously, to, to train pe young people, particularly to, to become the trainers of those who need that digital literacy as well. So there's, there's a huge amount here. And I think this is about sending out uh, a statement, not just what we want for our people and not just our ambitions to be a truly inclusive city region, but it is also a statement to potential investors in Greater Manchester, isn't it? That if you, if you have all of 
all of your residents supported to be online, you are also, I think, making a clearer statement around the talent pipeline to towards the, the, the digital uh, the digital sector. So it all does it all does tie together. So Phil, I know there was obviously the task force, the digital inclusion task force, which already did, was doing great work. What we've tried to do is build on the model that we had uh, through our work on homelessness. Uh, we had a homelessness action network, which really brought together a huge number of players in all of the different sectors across Greater Manchester. What we're trying to do now is replicate that approach in the digital world, where we build a network of, 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 of you know huge number of players who are prepared to come with us on this this journey, um, and that's really um, uh, what what we should be about in this in this next uh, in this next phase. Um, these are solvable problems. I think we all saw in the pandemic, without making a political point, that the government didn't have the will necessarily to put all young people online, and the GM Tech Fund did a great job um, in in getting more um, more connectivity out there and, and devices out there. But it can't just be a sort of one-off for the pandemic. I think this has got to become a core part of what we do. You know, there is an infrastructure now around food security for people through through food banks. They shouldn't have to be there, but it is there. And we've built an infrastructure there to support people. As I was saying before, we've built an infrastructure around homes and homelessness that, that, that is there. I, I see this as, as another part of people's human rights and um, making sure that they are connected to other human beings. That's what this is about, isn't it? It's not about kind of throwing expensive tech at people. This is about, in a, in a changed world post-pandemic, ensuring that all of our fellow citizens in Greater Manchester can connect to each other and therefore have all of the support and the and the opportunity that comes that comes with that. It's about changing the debate, the terms of the debate. It's about lifting our ambitions. It's about sending out a powerful statement from Greater Manchester that we will not leave any of our residents behind or cut off. The truth of the matter is, if we don't act in this space, the risks, we've seen how the pandemic has exposed the level of inequality that we have in our society. If we don't do what I'm talking about, I think that will get greater because as the world rushes into online into online working, it will further shut people out and it will increase those those divides between those who are in the room and those who are outside of the outside of the room. So I think it's about recognizing how the world has changed and you know, Great Manchester being the place that it is, uh, seeing that quickly, being at the forefront of, of the change that, that is needed. And recognising that you know industrial progress and social progress always go go hand in hand together. So, yeah, I, I'll leave it there, Phil. I mean, I'm, I am making the call today and putting it out to everyone on this on this call. There is more you can all be doing, and there's more that we can be doing uh, to solve this. This is a solvable problem if we put our minds to it, if we if we prioritise it in, in the right way. We have the means with, within all of our organisations within Greater Manchester to, to fix this. What, what we need to do is just become more organized in how we go about that uh, that work. So great, I've just been inspired by the conversations you were already having before I, before I joined. There is so much uh, to build on, but let's just sort of think about that, you know, 2025 or 2024, if you like, at the end of the, the blueprint, if we can say that we have made a massive change with regard to the connectivity of our residents, as well as all the other things that we will point to around infrastructure and skills and inward investment, I think we will then we will by rights be able to call ourselves the UK UK's leading digital city region. If we did the the skills and the investment and the infrastructure, but didn't do the inclusion, then I don't think we would we would be worthy of that that title, and we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to pat ourselves on the back about it because we'd be an even more divided city region, and we're not gonna going to let that happen. So I hope that's helpful, Phil, to sort of, uh, you know, bring bring things um, uh, to, to a close today. It sounds like it's been a, a brilliant session, but I'm just going to finish by saying I could not be more grateful to you, all of our team at the GMCA, all of the wider digital community in Greater Manchester who have massively stood forward in the last few years and, have, you know, demonstrated that it's not words, it is deeds. We are making ourselves a digital leader and I'm so proud of you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so very much, Andy. Uh, I think that's a, a massive call out to all uh, all organizations in Greater Manchester to turbocharge the, the task force and the Digital Inclusion Action Network and take this forward collectively as a city region. We talked about collaboration to innovate. 
right at the start. We talked, you know, Adam flagged the need for a big commitment. Uh, and we've set ourselves a target that says we will not succeed uh, unless we take our people with us, unless we meet the social obligation around digital, uh, as well as the economic uh, aspirations. And, and that seems very clearly uh, within our sites collectively. And we always talk about the fact that being a number, you know, a leading digital city region is not in any one organization's gifts. It's a collective responsibility. It's a collective ambition. And, you know, increasingly we are saying to the big players uh, and the small and social enterprises in Greater Manchester, if you're part of the digital ecosystem, please roll your sleeves up, get join in, be part of it uh, and, and help take take this forward. So uh, I think we'll we'll draw this to a, a close at this uh, final point, if if that's OK. It's been a well, bang on time, which is unheard of, frankly, in events like this. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining this session. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, uh, Andy, Andrew, uh, for, 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 for opening and closing this really important session. Helps illustrate to everyone how much progress we're making in the city region and where our priorities are and how we need to collectively drive forward to, to, to fulfil our ambitions as a city region uh, as we look forward over the next 12 months and, and beyond. So let's just, uh, let's just draw that to a close there. Bang on time. Thank you very much for joining this session today. Really appreciate it. Uh, and please be part of this journey as we move forwards, because it is a collective journey and, we, and we're all in it together. Thank you very much. Thanks.